Welcome to the Intersecting Us podcast, where math and life intersect. In today's podcast, the hosts discuss the power of math in human flourishing. Well, Intersecting Us, sometimes we uh, get into movies, sometimes uh, we get into different literature. Um, I thought I'd, today, as we're going to talk about power, that we might start off with a comic book. I don't Stan Lee put into the... Uh, in his comic books with all these heroes and and, uh, superheroes that with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's maybe a good segue into what this uh, chapter by Francis Sue and mathematics for human flourishing about power is Uh, Dave, you know, when we, we, you get into this, he talked about the fact that power often sounds like a bad word and he got into the power of things and the power of people. But one thing he gets into in a lot of this chapter, which is really good for math geeks, <laughs> is about 52 cards in a card deck. So why don't you tell us kind of why he did that with power and kind of what he was he was trying to get us to understand about the cards and how that, that deals with power and math. Right. It is kind of odd because the question he started with was, if you take a 52 deck of cards and you shuffle them, how many different possible combinations are there? And so you could start off with like, you know, ace of hearts, you know, jack of diamonds, king of spades, and yada, yada, yada. And how many different ways are there of arranging those 52 cards? And so I was a little surprised, like, okay, what does that have to do with power? And the way he phrased it was, as math people, we are, have the ability to answer those types of questions w- with an exact number. Whereas if you were not using math, you'd probably look at that and say, well, I'd have no idea like how to calculate it, but it seems like it's a large number. And it's like, I bet it's at least 10,000 and and maybe it's a million. I mean, maybe it's even a billion. I mean, I don't know. Once you get that high, who knows what, you know, what, you know, a million, a billion, there's just numbers after that. But you know, it's like kind of getting up there to those bigger numbers that we think about. But as math people, we have not only the ability to answer the question, what then he ended up pushing was not just what is the answer, but how does it have meaning? And then so he added a second twist to the problem that was going to contextualize the question and give it meaning. Yeah, and I think one of the things he did when he asked about the the combinations that could be done with 52 cards, and, and most of us, I mean, my family played cards a lot growing up. We do it now, you know, we play different different games with cards. And what he did, which I think I would make as an encouragement to people who say, well, I'm not that math oriented, you know, I'm listening to podcasts, I'm understanding some of it. He does such a good job of kind of, you don't have to know that much math to understand this book and get a lot out of it. He even shows you how it works, you know, yeah. The first mm-hmm. card is one in 52. The next one's in 51. You get this factorial thing. He does such a good job of that. But tell us more about what he does with that, though, and the concepts that he does and the way math can help us understand the perspective of it. Sure. So he said, uh, rather than asking for the answer, he gave us three questions and we had to determine which number was bigger. And so first question was the number of stars in the universe. The second one was the number of seconds since the Big Bang, since the beginning of time. And then the third one was the question of how many, what's the number of possible configurations of a deck of 52 cards? And so, you know, on one end, you're talking about the magnitude of the universe, so some space that's way out there that, you know, who knows how far things go, but we know there's like, you know, billions and billions and of stars out there. There's more than what we think we can count. And of course, from time, you can't go any further back of anything meaningful than the beginning of time, uh, like 13.8 billion years ago is what he used. Um, you know, that's a lot of years. The number of seconds that is, uh, that seems to be, you know, mind boggling large. And so of those three, which number is the largest? Yeah. And I, I remember reading it. it it's funny because you kind of, you trick yourself because when he, he did this, my first guess would have been the stars. Mm-hmm. But when he asked the question, I'm like, well, it's probably the 52 card thing because right. why would he do this if it wasn't, you know, and, and, and I, that was, you know, does become the answer, but it wasn't because it was intuitive. Right. Yeah. And the thing was, it wasn't because it was close either. And so the numbers he gave, uh, the smallest was the beginning of time. So we have only had 
10 to the 18th power of seconds since the beginning of time. So that's 10 with 18 zeros, still a very big number. Number of stars in the universe, that's uh, also 10 raised to the 23rd power. So we added five more zeros. So if you think about like going from maybe one and then five more zeros would be 100,000. So, yeah. you know, that type of magnitude, uh, multiplicative. So that that's a lot. But then the number of possible configurations of a deck of 52 cards, 10 raised to the 68th power. Yeah, yeah. That's so a- if you, uh, let's say you square something. Um, so if I've got like 10 times 10, that's 100. The way I can uh, figure out like how that much area that goes to is I take 10 to the first power and then times 10 to the first power and I add the exponents, one plus one, that equals two. That's 10 squared. That's a hundred. So if you multiply a number by itself, like as like squaring it, like creating a square, what you do is you add the exponents or double the exponents. So if we think of, let's take the biggest one, the number of stars in the universe. So line those up in some sort of line one by one into this, you know, a uh, line of 10 to the 23rd and then square that number. So go 10 to the 23rd and 45 or 90 degree angle, and then, you know, fill in all those dots to complete the square. So you've got 10 by 23rd and 10 by 23rd. So that's the number of stars are in 10 to the 46th. And we're still 46. Still we're still like about 20, uh, what, 22 uh, zeros away from 10 to the 68th. It's almost exactly triple. I mean, it's one, it's almost, one it's off. A cube. Yeah. Yeah, it's, almost a, it's almost a cube. So that's how many more combinations there are, which seems totally crazy because we're only talking about 52 cards in a deck. And that, that's not very many. And, and we shuffle cards all the time. And so how in the world, you know, can that get to such of a large number uh, with only 52 cards? And so that, that was a cool story. I did. I thought it was. It was probably one of the coolest stories. I might use that in other because uh, it's just it's one of those things that I would think most people would get the it wrong. You know, some uh-huh. people get it right because there's only three answers. But the way he he put it a couple different ways, which I thought was really neat. So he said, if a deck of cards were shuffled once per second since the beginning of time, <laughs> it would still be nowhere close to realizing all the possible co- configurations of cards. That that is mind boggling. I think it is. Yeah. So that would be. Let's see. That would be. The begin time that was ten to the eighteenth, so it'd be ten to the eighteenth. So that's yeah, I mean, ten to the sixty-eighth. So you know that's one out of ten to the fifty is probability. I yeah, think yeah. that's what that would be. Yeah, um, and it's, it's so you wouldn't even be near. You wouldn't even be a third of them. You know. Yeah. I mean, it, um, it, it's just so, amazing. Yeah. So he said that if you did that, the chances would be astronomically small that you would ever shuffle the deck in the exact same way two different times, you know, two yeah. times. And, oh, and, and you think about that with playing cards in Vegas and all this kind of right. stuff. It's kind of like, and they do like six, this is just 52 because they'll do like six card, six deck shoots and then they shuffle them all up. So then all this <laughs> you take, you know, you take it to the sixth pot, you know, it just gets amazing. And the other one he said was just, it just made my mind go, it was exceedingly likely that each time you shuffle a deck, that the resulting configuration has never happened before, right? In any deck that's ever been shuffled. I mean, that's just wow. It is. That is crazy. Yeah, I so thought that was. What do you say? Something about we, you make history every time you shuffle a deck. Every you time should... you shuffle, you just made math history because you just created had... and you and you can like almost be as confident of that as you know one out of you know ten to the fortieth power. You know, it's like so likely that you uh, will have a unique shuffle uh, that, you know, we can't guarantee it 100%, but it's as close as you could get to 100% without getting there. So that that uh, that is cool. So next time you get out your deck of cards, you shuffle it, assuming you give it a good random shuffle, realize you just made math history. Well, and even you think about the 10 to the 68th, I mean, that just comes from taking 52 times 51 times 50 mm-hmm. times 40 all the way down to one. I mean, that's right. how you get the number. And I'm sure it's probably a little bit rounded. Well, maybe it's not. I guess I, I'm kind of assuming it is. But so when it comes back to the whole concept of, of the chapter or the concept, so 
what, how is he applying that to power then? Mm -hmm. How, well, how does he use that? Yeah, I think the idea is just when we learn math, uh, we are, have the ability to, to solve things, to, to help, help, you know, humanity out. And, you know, as, uh, let's talk about actuaries. We learn things about like, let's say calculus. We learn things about finance. We learn things about exponential growth. Uh, we learn some things about uh, money and compound interest. We learn some things about probability. And we kind of throw all those different tools together. And those are just kind of like tools. Like, you know, a, a carpenter would have a, a hammer and they'd have like a, a table saw and they'd have all these tools, but those are just tools. But all those tools come together to build a house. And so for an actuary, we're going to use all those tools to make predictions about the future. And, you know, that gives the insurance company the power to issue a policy with confidence that they will be able to pay the claim <laughs> when that uh, benefit becomes due. And so that is uh, for you and me, probably a very realistic example of how knowing math can give us power in order to make, you know, the world a, a better world. Well, and I think it, it makes, once you get into, as you said that, you know, the, the change found the meter a little bit for me, the idea, it makes sense. You know, it, you're starting to understand the world when you go through these mm -hmm. concepts. And I think that is where he hit that, the, the power, he, he kind of did separate it into two things. And now as I think about it, it's, it's kind of, a little bit of what we've been doing with a lot at, at intersecting us. It's the idea of you, you have the power to make stuff, which he called stuff making, you know, mm -hmm. where you could, you could go out and make I don't, a card table, you know, <laughs> you know, to play cards on. You could make a deck of cards. You could make all kinds of different things and you can make insurance policies and those types of things too. But then he talked about sense making, which we have the power to sense making describes the ability to understand the world. And then, and to make meaning. And so, I mean, that's almost a definition of philosophy. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not quite, but it right. is the idea of, it's not, uh, we've talked about this before back in, in, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the 20th century, early 20th century, you had great mathematical and scientific minds make stuff and they had the power to make, they, they figured out how to split the atom. You know, mm -hmm. so that, I mean, and that's like, boom, that's really a lot of power. You know, they had the power to make power. Right. Uh, but th th when it came to how to, you know, the concepts of it and, and, and what's you, you get down to the, well, what sense does it make to use this? I just mm -hmm. read that, you know, and again, math geek, you remember the decimals, but, you know, 19.8% of all the power in our country in America is comes from nuclear power plants, which wow. is part of the, the math and science that we use to get that. But mm -hmm. when it comes back to using it as a bomb, now you're back into sense making. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes sense to use that to the power to do that, to capture it so we can power our computers and our cell phones and our lights and our for where we are now is pretty cold for our heaters. But does it make sense to mm -hmm blow people up with it, you know, and that that's a whole, that's a why question and a meaning question and an understanding the world question. And I think that he, I didn't, I didn't really think about that when I read that, but that, that is kind of more looking at it from more of a kind of a empirical way and a philosophical way. And he does a good job as he's done through this whole book of marrying those two in such a good way, but in his, but, and you can maybe talk to this a little bit or, or go into the next thing. Um, the, he did obviously put sense making kind of back to your 52 card thing. Yeah, you can figure out the data, but going through it, using a different perspective, looking at it with stars and seconds, it gave it more meaning for them and it mm -hmm. made more sense. And that, that, mm -hmm. that power that comes from there is what he kind of does in the rest of the chapter. One of my favorite stories on that, that some of our audience probably has heard when Steve Jobs had mentioned that when they came out with a new iPod, that it was like putting 2000 songs in your pocket. And so, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, it's all math. Uh, most technology geeks would have talked about hard drive or, uh, space and gig gigabytes and whatever. And, you know, jobs had an, an amazing ability to contextualize it. So it meant something to the customer. And we can all understand, wow, 2000 songs in my pocket. That, that sounds really cool. 
And uh, so that but that is something that was given because someone did the math. Um, you know, he wasn't just guessing, but he also thought about how to contextualize. And I think that is a skill that us actuaries and mathematicians can always grow into is going from getting an answer to being able to contextualize it, especially if we're communicating that answer to non-math people who may not have the in-depth knowledge of the math. They're going to want to understand well, why does this mean something? And uh, that's a, a whole nother challenge, but one that hopefully us math people can learn to grow into and step up and, and develop. Well, and I think, and eventually he gets into the use of power, which is kind of more of the of, of, of the meaning of it, because he uses the term uh, creative power, which mm-hmm. has to do with, uh, I think he even said sacrifice, but helping other people flourishing, which the whole book is kind of about that, versus coercive power, mm-hmm. which, and he gone to get in some really good examples of coercive power, the one, and I'm, I'm, I probably shouldn't even try to say her name. I know her first name was Sophia. Oh, yeah, I know <laughs> yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I Russian can try name. it. It's Kova Leveskova, but she she lived in the late 1800s. Um, a Russian mathematician was known for some important theorems with the I think it was partial differential equations and stuff. And uh, but she was because she was a woman, uh, they wouldn't let her be in the university. They wouldn't hire her and even though professors were trying to, but what he's talking about is, you know, coercive power limits other people's ability to create meaning. And that's, he used mm-hmm. that as, that was a great example. I don't know if you mm-hmm. uh, remember that one, but the idea of creative power, helping other people and coercive power being kind of more self-centered is kind of the way mm-hmm. he was putting it, I think. Right. The part I found that I appreciated when he was talking about creative power in this chapter was the idea that we have as math people, the ability to make definitions. And we often don't think about that when we first start off in our math career because everyone else is defining things for us. But as you develop in your career, you learn that, hey, we, we have the opportunity to define whatever we want. And so uh, it may be just something as simple as if you're doing an algebra problem and you're giving a story and they, you know, they tell you uh, all this information and then you you look at that and you say, okay, well, I'm going to let X be the distance f- between here and the house. And I'm going to let Y be the distance from the bottom of the house to the roof. And so you just define something. That was something that you had the power to do. And once you make that definition, which you have the power to do, well, then you are fixed and stuck into, you know, using that definition throughout the, the rest of the problem. And so you can't just, you know, invent every step of the way. Uh, when you inv- invent a definition, you must be consistent in how that definition is used. So, but it's, it's something that once you start on that, it's, it, you tend to be a little shy on it. But as you get good at it, it's really a lot of fun. The, the, as they say, the world is your oyster and you can just start invent, you know, defining anything you want. And, uh, and so you you find that there's tremendous power and creative power in doing the math. Well, because ultimately you're 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 looking at the deep meaning of it, not just you know it's solving equations or whatever you want mm-hmm. to call it. And I think that's the meaning keeps coming back. I think he even talked about how a computer can do the stuff making, but it can't really do the sense making. You know, which kind of goes back to boy, that's been a while that we had a we had a podcast on artificial intelligence, you know, the idea, sentience, sapience, all that stuff. But the idea, it's kind of the same concept he was talking about here. A computer can do all kinds of make all kinds of things. We're seeing that with chat GPT and all these artificial intelligent algorithms and things. But they really they don't really know why they're doing it. There's no meaning. They're just they're just zeros and ones is what it really comes down Mm -hmm. to. And I think that's where the human mind being able to ponder this stuff is always going to be better than an artificial because of the ability to really understand what meaning is and mm-hmm. not just results. And there's power in that. So I, I, I guess I just want to tell our audience, I think as intrinsic human beings with the mind and all this, that we are always going to be more powerful in that way philosophically and define mind things in math or any other discipline than any artificial 
mind would it be able to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the one thing that I was thinking about in this book that really didn't come out too much in this chapter, but it was the first thing I thought about with power. And so I'm going to ask you, Brian, if I say the word recycle, what comes to mind? A blue bin. I mean, that you, you put your, your stuff in the, that's what we do here. Anyway, you throw your, oh. you know, your recyclables in, in a blue okay. bin and then it right. goes in a yeah. different spot. And then the, the whole reason why you're doing that as opposed to a garbage would be so that they would, the materials would get reused, right? Right. You want, you're trying to be good stewards of the, good uh, stewards or, and, or whatever. <laughs> you know, and we all kind of feel good about ourselves. We feel a little greener, you know, in our innermost self when we recycle things and we just did Mother Nature, you know, a favor. So all that's good. Uh, but one thing that I think about all the time in math is that math has this incredible ability to recycle things. And what do I mean by that? So if we uh, think about something that Albert Einstein said, the eighth wonder of the world, so this is power, is uh, compound interest. You know, the, the idea is that, you know, if if you understand compound interest and, and let it do the work for you, you can be, you know, wealthy. Uh, and that's why insurance companies uh, make the money they do is because, boy, do they understand compound interest. So there's definitely power in that. And compound interest simply just means you keep taking interest and reinvesting it and get more interest on the interest. So at its core, what it is, is a simple exponential process, whereas simple interest is a linear process. So if your money is growing in account at simple interest, uh, you put a $100 in and you don't touch it. It's just going to grow like a straight line. It'll go up, but just like a straight line where compound interest will be an exponential curve, you know, then that takes off and soon gets really big. So that is, you know, the power of compound interest is leveraging the idea of exponential growth. Well, once you learn that, uh, let's say now you jump over to music and you want to start learning how to work with octaves. Octaves and music is like on a piano key. You go from like one C to the next C. And what you learn in music that the, the, the hertz that we use to represent each note increases exponentially for each octave. And so like one A may be like at 440. Then the next A is double that at 880. Then the next A is double that again at 1760. And the math for how uh, the keys on a piano are organized is the exact same math as that we use in compound interest. There is like literally no difference between the two. And so once you learn how to use compound interest in the exponential process, you can recycle the exact same math and now apply it to music. And it just works. Like, why it works? Well, you know, that's a whole other question, but it does work. And in math, we do that all the time. And the more math you know, the more you have kind of like at your disposal of things you can recycle. And that is really something I find very cool is when I'm working on something and out of the blue, not expecting it at all, I can all of a sudden use a new tool, a tool I've known for a long time and then apply it to something that I wasn't expecting. And I've recycled something that, you know, was there. I didn't have to learn really anything new. I just had to make that connection. It's like, oh, that's what I need. I need to, I need to use this tool right here. Well, and I think whether it's math, science, uh, even philosophy, you tend to stand on the shoulders of other people. And, you know, we talk the Oilers of the world, the Socrates, the, you know, the different uh, philosophers that are out there, the Einsteins, you, you, you go from there and go f further. And that, that's kind of what he was hitting with create. This is the creative power. Probably people who came up with, with the idea of compound interest were not thinking about music, but the fact that they put that out there and showed how it was done and understood what was going, the meaning of it, somebody was able to take it. And that's when he gets into, what did he use the word? Uh, amplification, I think it was. Mm -hmm. It was the idea that uh, if you use math to serve others, that it has an amplification effect. Then, mm. And uh, I think in that letter, um, if, if you haven't read the book, there's a he's corresponding with a young gentleman, I think. I don't know how guess how young he is. Uh, that's trying to learn math in prison. And he was talking about how how uh, in, in that letter he was talking about how the this guy was seeing how much math was used by scientists to get, you know, these these flourishing things. And 
amplifying things. And I thought that was really cool that the creative power can, you know, can rescue and help and help uh, millions flourish just because you were uh, humble enough to kind of say, hey, I understand this. Here it is. And the power that's there. But mm-hmm. I like the way because he, he said that at the beginning, power is usually like an evil thing or a bad mm-hmm. thing. You know, mm-hmm. what's the old, uh, I don't even know who said this. Is it Machiavelli? Somebody power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And that's what a lot of us look at power. But I think the way Sue's doing it so much better and the way math does it is so much better. The idea that when you do a math proof, that's for everybody to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you, 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 you publish it and then everybody can use it next, you know. Right. Uh, and I right. think that's that's the cool that's that's the power we're looking for. Power doesn't have mm-hmm. to be bad. It's what the what what your end game is. Right. Uh, and the gentleman you mentioned, his name is Chris. And I, I guess we ha- haven't really talked too much about Chris because he's in every chapter and it's a truly remarkable story. But the idea is he was uh, he's in prison and he developed this dialogue with the author, Sue, and they would just talk about math. And Chris, you know, was there. I think he was in there for a felony. And he was in there for a long time, like 20 years. But he started picking up math in prison. And uh, I don't think he mentioned it in this chapter, but he talked about in other chapters was that math has the ability to transform time and, you know, places and things like that. And so even though he's in prison, uh, he's cut off from physical world of our society. He was still able to do math. And so math had this ability to give him power while he was in prison because now his mind could grow and learn more math. And for him, uh, he really, you know, learned a lot of subjects and was very motivated by it. Uh, and, you know, if I was in prison, that's probably what I'd be doing as well. And, you know, it, it just kind of gave him joy while he was in prison. So I think that's a cool story about the power of math is it's not limited by race or culture or, you know, your wealth. It's really just what you are willing to put in and, and to understand. Yeah. And I think that Sue himself and, you know, uh, neither one of us have met him, but he seems like he's he's got that kind of altruistic idea of, you know, the, the, you're supposed to be putting other people's first, that virtue in everything mm-hmm. that he talks about. And he talks about it with power here, too. He He uses the difference between creative power, which is humble and sacrificial and other centered. Versus coercive power, which is uh, limited because it's only about yourself and one and looking at, at one particular thing and, and worrying more about you and holding it over people. Mm-hmm. And so I think he does a good job. And kind of what made me think of that is the fact that he, you know, the fact that he's even taken time to talk to this guy. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, right. Sue, I, I think he gets some enjoyment out of it, but he, he's not getting out anything out of this, any, any external goods by, by sure, right. you know. But I think he's getting some internal stuff, you know, he's getting Uh and that's what he really cares about, which is kind of tells us why this book has been so intriguing for us to go through and look Mm -hmm. at and read and discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's truly motivating for me. And uh, there's so many aspects of it, of the story that uh, motivates me. But certainly the story about Chris is, you know, a wonderful thing to, to chew on. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And I, I've been in prisons with people to to teach them some things in the past. And it, it's a captive audience. Uh, but you don't do it to uh, necessarily make yourself money or anything like that. You you do it kind of like Sue's doing here, just to to try to think about someone else and maybe to to maybe see what, what they can do, even if they're behind bars for a while. They can still there's still a, a human being that has intrinsic qualities that that gifts mm-hmm. that it's just neat to see him reaching out each end of each chapter with a letter and stuff. So, mm-hmm. so I do have a kind of an ending quote. Did you have anything you wanted to add as we kind of well, wrap up? Here? Maybe I'll, I'll give one quick story uh, because it's one that m- many math people have heard about. That is the proof of Fermat's last theorem. And basically Fermat had this idea of proving that if you have this equation, a to the N plus B to the N equals C to the N, that that would be true for only integers one and two, but not, anything greater than two. And so it's it's a big theorem that's out there, more than likely you've heard about them. But the idea was, you know, it's just a number a, a question about numbers, integers is what it was about. And that was posed uh, by Fermat, who lived about 400 years ago. And many of the great math people tried to solve it, couldn't get to it. And finally, in the 1990s, it was proved by a guy named Andrew Wiles, 
And what was interesting about it for this, uh, for today was how he proved it was, uh, he used something called elliptical curves. And they, you know, if we think about el- ellipses, we know they're curves. And so elliptical curves, we know is curves, it's continuous. And it seems like it has nothing to do with integers, which was the essence of the problem. But he was able to prove something with elliptical curves that math people then were able to recycle that logic and say that that is also mathematically equivalent to proving Fermat's last theorem. And so Wiles gets proof uh, credit for proving Fermat's last theorem, even though his solution, his proof, only had to do with elliptical curves. But um, you know, the math powers at B were able to connect the dots and say, yes, those are two different things from appearance wise, but mathematically they are one and the same. And wow, that, that is so cool. Well, it just shows you the power of, of understanding the meaning, you know, the stuff that you can, it's not the, the stuff that you make, it's the understanding that actually uh-huh. makes it and the stuff comes from that. Yeah. So. Well, I'm going to end up, this is on page 142. I just thought it, it was a word that you probably wouldn't use for a power that you don't think, but creative power is humble. I just thought that was such a cool, you know, and it puts others first, which is kind of a, almost a definition of humble to some extent. It seeks to unleash creativity in others. Coercive power would never do that. And I thought he, that was a good, good way to end it, that it's, it's, it's humble because it's sacrificial. And it's trying to think of others first. So you're, it's kind of back to the whole meaning of the book, mathematics for human flourishing. The idea that you're not doing it. You're not the only human that's flourishing there. It's the other people <laughs> that we're trying to, to get to flourish there. So as we continue through this book, we do, we do really encourage you to get the book. Um, obviously, uh, we think it's a, a very good book to read, whether you're just a little bit interested in math, but if you're <laughs> interested in life, it will, it will humble you. And in, in this chapter, it shows us how power does not have to be look, looked at as something that's evil, but can be something that looked at as good because it can help other people find their creative power and make their life flourish also. been the Intersecting Us podcast. To further engage with Intersecting Us, go to intersectingus.com.